Hey everybody, on today's episode of Still To Be Determined, we're gonna be talking about bright ideas and why my neck is so white. <laughs> As usual, I'm Sean Farrell, I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi, I write some stuff for kids, and I'm also curious about technology and where it's taking us. And luckily for me, my brother is Matt of Undecided with Matt Farrell, and that's why we're all here to talk about his videos, his discussions of tech breakthroughs and changes in our daily lives. And Matt, how are you? I'm good. It's been a good weekend. How about you? Not too bad. I've been beset by allergies of an unknown source. So yeah, that's always exciting. Like what a lovely day. My eyes are on fire. <laughs> Before we get into the newest episode, which we're going to be talking about in a few minutes, and that's about solar panel breakthroughs, I wanted to share some thoughts from our most recent episode. This was our discussion on desalinating technologies, and there was this from Richard Papworth, who at the end of last episode, I said, Matt, so what do we have coming up next? And you said, well, in the future, we're going to be talking about fusion. Mm -hmm. And Richard Papworth showed up and said, I hope the fusion video is at least an hour long. There are so <laughs> many companies doing it in different ways. There's a huge amount of info to convey. So yeah. Matt, you've got your yes. work cut out for you. Yes, I do. <laughs> There's also this comment from driller dev. Sorry if I'm repeating myself or if this is the result of some condition, Sean, but if the color difference between your face and your neck is the result of sunburn, Matt should buy you a new hat for your birthday. <laughs> Yes. And driller, I'll be honest, I have no idea why my head and my neck are different colors the way they are. <laughs> For anybody who's listening to this as opposed to watching it, I think I just basically have a pretty nice tan on my face. And that's despite the fact I wear sunscreen and a hat all the time. But my <laughs> neck, no, my neck, she is not tanned. She is very pale. So it does create an interesting... <laughs> Is he wearing a Mardi Gras mask or what's going on here? Nobody's not, nobody's sure. But thank you for weighing you in, need the, You need the uniform paleness of me. <laughs> yes, there is that too. I mean, it's, it's, I think I, I maybe spend a little bit more time outside than Matt. And yes, you know, it's anybody who's looking at just the video right now. I mean, I mean, look at the space behind him. <laughs> I, I live in a cave. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Very dark. <laughs> and there was this comment from Real Foggy who had this to say, hope my comments get read sometime. Good show after the show. Thanks for reading the comments. Well, you're welcome, Foggy. And look, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> but as I mentioned before, we're going to be talking about Matt's most recent episode. This is from September 13th, 2022. It's from the episode titled, This Invention Could Supercharge Solar Panels. And it is... Basically, a lens effect that helps capture more sunlight. And there was a lot of discussion around what this could do and how it would impact the technology. And correct me if I'm wrong, this technology is in some cases, there are some starting uh, levels of this technology that are currently in use. Yes. Oh, yeah. Th yeah. Concentrated solar is not anything new. It's been around for decades. Right. And there were commenters that pointed that out. This is nothing new. Yeah. Concentrated solar as a genre of technology is well established and has been tried and oftentimes failed. This is a new take, a new entrant into the field for this. And what makes it a new entrant? What is the, what is the element here that is different from what exists before? It's the structure of how it concentrates the light. Several people pointed out Fresnel lenses, which is something that's really old technology. It's been around for a very long time. Right. But you can take a Fresnel lens and put it on top of a solar cell and concentrate the light too. But the thing is, is like where Fresnel lenses, like the, the, the cone or the, the radius that it can pull light in from to concentrate it is much narrower than what this new one, this agile structure does. It's a much wider area that it can concentrate light from versus a Fresnel lens. And it's it's the way that they've, it's an actually graded system, that little pyramid shape, the way it reflects the light down. That's the new thing on top of which of how it's manufactured, because they're looking at this as being 3D printed, which makes it a very easy cost-effective way to manufacture it. So 
they're kind of tackling two things, a new way that they're concentrating the light, the design of it is new, as mm-hmm. well as the manufacturing technique being applied to do it is what they're, they're hoping is the secret sauce to make this a more affordable mass producible way to do concentrated solar. Yeah. It seems like there's the major breakthroughs that people read about as the Eureka. And then there are advancements like this, which are still advancements, but it's an invention break the mold. It's It's an improvement upon the earlier, what came before. Yeah. Yeah. The earlier, it's all iterative. It's like, it's all iterative. You come up with it, you have the Eureka moment, and then there's all these things that come after that Eureka moment, trying to make that thing better, make it so that you can scale it up, that you can mass produce it. It's all those things have to happen after that initial Eureka. And so this is like somewhere along that line. That's where this falls. Yeah, there was a little bit of pushback by one commenter I saw, and I didn't I didn't record their comment to use it as a direct reference, but their the gist of their comment was effectively there's always this conversation around the improvement of the tech, but then when you see the price points, it's always higher and outside the range of common usage. And I wanted to bring that up simply as a that's part of the normal pattern. That yeah. You know, you have this advancement and a change and then eventually as economies of scale kick in, once more people are utilizing that tech, it becomes cheaper to then manufacture and manufacturing becomes more precise and more experienced in manufacturing leads to a drop in prices. Yeah. Just look at, look at solar panels and batteries. Just look at the prices of what it cost for lithium ion batteries 20 years ago. And the same thing for solar panels 20 years ago versus what they are today. It's night and day. And it's because of the rapid advancement and understanding of how to manufacture these things with less loss in the manufacturing process to be better at it, to be, have a higher, you know, instead of having to throw away 30% of what you're manufacturing, you're throwing away 5% of what you're manufacturing. So it's like, it just, all of it just drops the costs, which makes it more affordable for mass market. All of this stuff starts expensive and then can, if it works out, work its way down. So it's, can they do that? That's the big question. Right. <laughs> yeah. It also, the price point also is affected by competition. And if there are oh, yeah. competitions from a number of other sources that forces solar to figure out, well, how do we compete? That uh, Mm -hmm. helps drive down the cost. And the one that always, like the model that always stands out for me is VCRs. The VHS and Betamax. Yeah. The whole (laughs) competition between two technologies, one of which was arguably better. It was the loser in the race simply because the other one was able to beat the price enough. And then by the end of the cycle of V VCRs being the means with which we recorded television and, and kept it in our homes, you could go out and get a new VCR for about 25 bucks. I remember it 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 felt a little bit like if you bought two boxes of cornflakes and sent in the box tops, they'd send you a free VCR for your trouble. (laughs) It was like giveaways with happy meals and McDonald's, that kind of thing. And it was ridiculous how much they cost when they first came out. And that's, that's kind of, to me, I always keep that in mind. Like that's the life cycle of pricing that's starts off. It's going to be exorbitantly expensive and obviously outside of the realm of most people. And then over time it drips into the mainstream and becomes something that we can budget around. And then once competition starts to show up and for VCRs, it was of course DVDs and digital and suddenly the bottom fell out and you could pick these things up for nothing. So, and that's, you know, all to say, I think that there's a day, not necessarily right around the corner, but as Matt has talked about in previous videos, the solar market is a growing used solar panel market Mm -hmm. alongside new technology like this. So 15 years from now, if you're thinking about putting solar on your home and it doesn't have solar right now, you could go with the newest tech, which is probably going to cost you quite a bit. You could go with tech that's being developed right now in 2022, which might be these panels at a used cost, which would be a lot less. Or maybe you even go with panels that are a model that's being produced from 10 or 15 years ago, but they may still be making them, but they may be so dirt cheap at that point 
yep. that it may not cost you much more than the tiles on your roof. So we're going to see a number of different tiers. There will be in 15 years that bottom tier, which is this technology is 30 years old, but it still works and it might meet your needs. So exactly. Yeah. And this, and, and to, on this agile thing specifically, it, it may never ever catch on because there may be competing like the Betamax VHS thing. There might be a VHS model that comes out, beats them to the punch cheaper. Yeah. It's more efficient to produce and it just kind of cuts the legs out from under something like this. So yeah, it, there's so many things that in play that you, I, I do not want to predict what's going to be the winner or loser here, but it's, it's a fascinating invention that I thought was worth looking at. Yeah. You mentioned agile and it made me want to jump ahead to this comment that I wanted to share from Shane Wilson. And I've actually seen this technology in action and it is very basic, very straightforward, does the job, but mm -hmm. Shane weighs in with this agile is a classic idea used on sailing vessels in the form of deck prisms. It's amazing how much sunlight is brought below decks from a few square inches of flat glass on a deck panel. It makes perfect sense that prismatic techniques could be applied to solar panels. Yeah, yeah, I've been there where you go below deck on a on a sailing vessel and you're like, why is the sun shining so brightly in this room? And it's all because of a little tiny square in the ceiling yeah. that's simply conducting sunlight. Yep. Also in the comments, I wanted to share this one from Paul Mullen, who wrote, I worked on a similar technology in my research lab around eight years ago. The main benefit of a low concentrator photovoltaic PV is increased efficiency at suboptimal angles. The numbers were often muddy. You can get twice the energy per square meter of PV panel, sure, but when you ultimately use less PV panel, as a lot of room is taken up by the concentrator, then it's a moot point. The biggest limiting factor is that the greatest degradation factor for PV panels is their operating temperature. And when you concentrate the sunlight, they will get hotter, causing them to degrade mm -hmm. faster. Our research okay. was specifically looking at ways to extract thermal energy from a domestic scale solar concentrator. This was one, to cool the panels, two, to extract some thermal energy for hot water tank preheating, and three, to prolong the life of the panel. It was ultimately not deemed cost effective. You could double or triple the life of the panel, but you have massively increased your installation cost so it would likely be cheaper to replace the panels every 10 to 15 years. It's, I think, a really great <laughs> breakdown of yes. what companies like Agile have been up against and trying to figure out how do we make this work. The, the, the fact that your square footage of the panels changes as a result of the yep. inclusion of a prism is just the first headache, and it's not even the biggest one. I love the fact that yep. it brings up like you're heating up your panels twice. You're getting twice as much light, twice as much heat. So it's like all of these things adding, adding, adding to the complication of all this. So there, there's, there's three things. I, I remember re I read that comment when it was posted. There's three things about that comment I love. One, I love it when people that are actually working on technologies like this chime in in the comments, drop in their knowledge and firsthand experience doing it. I, I freaking love it. And the second thing is, he brought up an aspect I should have touched on the video. And for me, this is a huge failure in my opinion of my video. I didn't talk about the heat aspect at all. And I should have because heat is not good for uh, solar cells. It affects their efficiency. It affects their longevity. And I should have brought that up and talked about it in the video because it does shorten their lifespans. And there is the complication of you sometimes ways to get around that is they try to cool the panels with cooling systems. So there can be additional complexity depending on what you do to try to, to do that. But it's, it's so for me, I was, I was, I saw a bunch of comments about that. What about the heat? And it was like, oh no, I should have talked about the heat in the video. and just didn't. Let me weigh in so with this comment, which is almost a direct, yeah. direct response to Mr. Mullen. Kitty cat jumped into the yeah. comments as a separate comment, not in response to Mr. Mullen. Yeah but jumped in separately to say something I find incredibly interesting is how this system could be a part of a design which integrates these and the negative space they provide in between the solar cells for very small, very high efficiency thermal conduits that whisk away the concentrated mm -hmm. heat from the reflective materials and many cells being further connected to a home heat pump system. So yep. this is something that you've got the person saying, Hey, there's an issue. And then you've got a person saying, Hey, I think I've got another add on now. 
Kitty Cat's idea, what I love, one of the things I love about this, it taps into my sci-fi writer brain. And I envision a house that has just coils and tubes and <laughs> whirly gigs and smigaba jobs and all sorts of little things and doohickeys popping out on the side. Steampunk and it's house. Just, just a total steampunk house, but it's a normal nuclear family. Like, you know, dad's coming home from work. He's got his pipe and he's got his little hat and he's like, hello, dear. How was your day? And she's like, well, the thingamajig just popped again. So you're going to have to get up on that roof and fix it. And he's like, oh, darn. Like, I just love the, the idea of it's these like houses of leave becoming so strange in this way with all yeah. these little tubes and, and, uh, things to take up. I love the fact that it's taking up the negative space between the solar panel cells, like use every square inch, make the technology work for you. Yeah. But one other thing that I think it was Paul brought up, which was, it just wasn't worth it based on what his experience was because of the additional cost and complexity. I kind of did touch on that in my video when I was talking about the part of the reason I brought up the whole, the tilting <laughs> systems is because when you look at the numbers for like what it costs to do one of those versus just slap a panel on a flat, you know, fixed structure, it usually doesn't work out that great because you can add a few extra panels to make up for the lack of efficiency that you get with the tilting systems, not in all cases, but in some cases. So it's kind of touches on what he brought up, which is. It, this system may not make sense in all situations. It right. may have very isolated, unique use cases. So that's something else to keep in mind. So many, I got to say, there were so many smart comments in, on this video. I was yeah. very impressed. Yeah. Do you think this might be a technology that's largely found well above and below the equator as opposed to being uh, something that might be in a majority of, of city cities, cities that are within a certain band around the equator, maybe normal yeah. panels are going to be perfectly fine and the price point wouldn't be yeah. an issue. But if you're further North or South, you know, maybe in Alaska, they exactly. might need something like this because there's just not going to be enough daylight. Otherwise it could make sense. It's part of the reason I was interested in this because where I live, the swings over the course of the year on how much energy I can produce is pretty massive just because of how low the sun gets in the sky during the winter. It's like, if you had systems like this, it could basically just help to kind of maybe potentially counteract some of that and reduce the, the massive drops you see in the middle of winter. Right. It introduced an interesting detail that I hadn't considered before that the panels on your roof might not be parallel to the roof. It hadn't occurred to me that you would have yeah. potentially panels that would be mounted with an incline. I see panels here in the city that are on flat roof buildings, you know, in my neighborhood, up. brownstones yeah. are all over the place and the panels you can tell are tipped and it makes sense. Like, well, it's a flat roof and they wanted to get an angle that would help. It hadn't occurred to me that if we were further North, the incline would be even steeper. And if you had a tilted roof, you might even need further tilt depending on how far yep. north or south you are. So it's it's an interesting uh, complication to to see in action and to think about how it might be changing the profile of homes of people who might be putting these on. Yep. So listeners, what do you think about the future for panels like this? And what do you think about the price point for panels like this? Do you see, like I suggested, multi-tier markets where you have all sorts of options ahead of you and if so what price point would you be jumping in on are you holding out uh as matt is always saying don't hold out for a future when you've got something today but are you yep. thinking yeah five years from now i want the top tier or are you thinking i'm waiting for the market to become flooded with all these used panels that are going to be coming out and i'm going to scoop up some some things that still have 15 years of life let us know jump into the comments share your thoughts don't forget, if you'd like to support the show, you can review us on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever it was you found this podcast. You can go back there and say, when it comes to panels, this panel is terrific. <laughs> or maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> and if you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to stilltbd.fm, click on the Become a Supporter button, throw some coins at our heads. We appreciate the bruises. You can also click Join on YouTube and become a supporter that way. All of that really does help support the show. Thank you so much for listening or watching, and we'll talk to you again next time.